I want to um, acknowledge today that the landscape we refer to as the Yellowstone Tukon region accomplishes the, uh, encompasses the homelands of many, many Indigenous peoples. Why do I recognize and respect the rights of Indigenous peoples as outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples, including the right to self-determination? Why do I also acknowledge that the history of protected areas in both Canada and the United States has included rights violations, displacement, loss of access to traditional territories and other intergenerational impacts on Indigenous peoples. Pardon me. We further yeah. recognize that Indigenous peoples protect 80% of the Earth's biodiversity in the lands and waterways they have stewarded since time immemorial. We are deeply grateful for this living legacy and we aim to support Indigenous peoples in their continued stewardship of these precious lands and waters. So welcome to you all. We've had great interest in this workshop. Thank you for being here. Um, this is the uh, second phase of our ethical space series of workshops, which started last year. And this is now our sixth. So if you would like to, uh, if you're interested in previous sessions, uh, they're all recorded and you can find information and resources online at y2y.net slash ethical space, which I think Nadine is putting in the chat. So the objectives for the whole ethical space series are threefold. One, it's a learning experience for non-Indigenous people about Indigenous authority. Two, it's an opportunity for relationship building amongst us all. And three, um, sets us all up as a community to more effectively work together in support of Indigenous-led conservation. And we have three outcomes that we're looking for deeper understanding of Indigenous frameworks and reconciliation concepts, a sense of being part of a network of peers engaging with these questions, and also inspiration, empowerment, and support for taking next steps individually and within our organizations and other domains. So we have seen a broad uh, cross-section of, of sectors and domains represented. I kind of won't list them off. Um, but it, it's been really, really wonderful to see uh, the variety of folks and their, uh, and their uh, well, I keep saying, using the words dom word domains. Uh, I guess that's a systems thing. Um, Zoom, uh, Zoom stuff, please keep yourself muted except when you're in a breakout room. Keep your cameras on during the Q&A. It's so wonderful to see faces. We also understand that Everybody's zoomed out and it's sometimes you need to turn those cameras off and that's okay too. And uh, just some sort of uh, Zoom health is, uh, you know, back away from your computer a little bit if you can. Uh, it really helps to look up and away and change your focal length. And my favorite, you can turn off self view so that you don't have to stare at yourself and wonder how you look. And you can do that by, um, you'll find that in your little drop down, the three dots up on your right. I feel like that has actually saved my life in the last two years. So um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Jillian Stavely. Jillian is a Cascadena member whose heritage lies in the Muncho Lake region of Denakai in Northern BC. Through Jillian's connection with her heritage and her culture, she's actively promoting the conversation around what indig indigeneity means in the 21st century. Jillian has worked predominantly in the resource development sector as a traditional land use practitioner, consultant, and archaeologist. Her goal in her work that she does today as the Director of Land Stewardship and Culture for the Denakaye Institute is to ensure that the relationship that exists between her nation and the province, that respect for Casca laws, Denakaye Kusan, and the commitment under the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples is upheld in all discussions about Denakaye, the people's country. Jillian's primary work over the past few years has been promoting the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area proposal with the Casca Ancestral Territory in BC. Thank you, Jillian, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, Sukasin La. Thank you so much, Candice. Yes, Dinta. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jillian Stavely. And uh, I am so happy to be here with you all today. This is going to be a really great discussion. And I love that I'm seeing some familiar faces, but some new faces too. 
And uh, here, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. So hopefully this works. Can you see it? Yes. Good. Okay, great. Yes. So I am Cascadena, as, as uh, Candice mentioned, I'm from the Wolf Clan and uh, I'm part of the Liard First Nation. And I'm so lucky that I get to call Denakaya my home. And you'll hear me talk about it a lot that way in today's uh, discussion. But basically what that is, what Denakaya is, is the unceded traditional territory of the Cascadena. And in this workshop, I know we're gonna be going through a lot of wonderful, wonderful discussions, but I think really at the end of the day, it's about coming uh, together in a, in a good way to speak about the lands that, that we all love. So these discussions of ethical space and two-eyed seeing and the colonization, indigenization, reconciliation, they're all such important topics for us to be actively involved in in the conservation world. And I feel like there's a shift taking place, and I'm curious to know if you do as well, about people being more open to, dis to educating themselves uh, on the part of that change that is needed. And so to help set some of the context for the learning journey that I hope we're going to be able to take here together today is to just provide a bit of a setting of my relations to this conservation work and and how I'm connected to the vision that I'll be sharing with you today of the Cascadena's vision. And I think that'll be a great way for us to show how Indigenous-led conservation is a really important example of reconciliation, uh, but also Indigenous resurgence. So I wanted to start off today by sharing a little bit of my story and who I am and where I'm from, because I think it's very important to position ourselves in our work and we, we need to do that when we're talking about the land because we need to acknowledge where we come from, who we are, who our relatives are, what connects us to these places. And uh, for me, I am so lucky to come from a, a long line of Casca women who have advocated for their land and their language and their culture for generations. So it's easy for me to take on that role. And in the, the bottom there, you'll see a picture of my Etsu and my Etsia, my, my grandma and grandpa. They were both raised in, in Denakaya, and uh, it, it's a Esquan, it's our home. It's called the people's country. That's actually what Denakaya means. And my, my mom and my family is from Northern BC, Southeast Yukon. So in the picture at the top there, you'll see Muncho Lake. And that's part of the Muskwakachika management area in Northern BC. And, and it's an area where my family's from traditionally. But I also like so many indigenous uh, Canadians also have settler background as well. My, my dad was a eighth generation Newfoundlander. So he was, a, he was a Maritimer through and through. So I call myself as being part of Turtle Island, like many of you, I'm sure. But I, I've always had that deep connection to, to being part of Casca country. And I currently live in Casca country in the farther northern region of our territory in the Yukon. And I live in a small town right now called Faro. Some might know it. Uh, it was at one point in time the largest lead zinc mine in the world. And it was a, it was a town named after a card game, believe it or not. Um, but more importantly, it was a town that was created without the consent of my people, of, of the Cascadena. So I get to living in this place, really see firsthand every day the impacts of poor decision making of previous governments and industry and stakeholders in creating what it, another failed mine within our territory and one that will continually be paid for by tax paying Canadians because Faro is actually a mine that will never truly be remediated. Uh, it's not actually environmentally possible based on the damage done to the landscape, but also to the people, to the people of the Ross River Dana and the families that have called this area home since time immemorial. So living in this place has really guided me in how I, I view the world around me. But what else has guided me is that deep connection that I have to these lands. And it's something that both of my parents uh, instilled in me at a very young age. They were land stewards. Um, they were caribou biologists and they were also breeders of knowledge. And I, I know in my life that they were bringing in Western science and indigenous knowledge uh, to me before it became a buzzword that we use today. 
Um, but I see myself as being a practitioner in that as well. And even though I was trained in, in the Western sciences, I am bringing Indigenous knowledge into the forefront of everything that I do. And I, I, I try to do that on a daily basis. So I wanted to include a little bit of a picture of myself too of some of the work that I've done in the past on ice patch um, work in the Yukon, you know, being able to hold an arrow that's 1200 years old and knowing that that was someone's livelihood and it still is in a lot of ways. So I, I actively am trying to create that, that ethical space for us to be able to see things in a different way. And I'm trying to bring that into this into this uh, workshop today to bring to you Casca's understanding of ways of knowing, doing, and being in this world. And I've really noticed that there's a resurgence happening in Indigenous communities about connecting back with that knowledge, but also connecting back with their lands to find the healing that is needed during this very troubling time in our world today. And the Casca Dana have a very strong land ethic, and I'll be sharing part of that with you today as well. And it's something that's been continuously passed down by each generation within each Casca community. And today, when we find ourselves uh, in, in this Indigenous-led conservation work that is being more recognized and supported, our communities are able to find that the values that are rooted in that land ethic, we're going to be able to help manage our land according to those values. And many feel that IPCAs are the answer to that, to that call to action. Um, and we will talk today as well about the challenges that exist in that as well, and the opportunities, but also the responsibilities that we all have as, as part of that work. So just to share with you a little bit more about who the Cascadena are, because some of you may, this may be the first time you're hearing uh, about this community and this nation. But the Cascadena are an unceded nation of people, and we have a very large traditional territory. It's around 20 or 240,000 square kilometers, and that's around roughly 24 million hectares, which is a large area. Um, you can scope it out to the state of Oregon, to be exact. So it makes us one of the larger Indigenous nations in Canada by, by scale of geography. And because our homeland is so vast, we actually encompass 25% of the Yukon and around 10% of BC, and as well as some portions of the Northwest Territories. And our, our population, our, our nation is, is really deeply connected through our language and our culture and our traditions where there's quite a high degree of mutual intelligibility between the dialects within our, within our ancestral lands. So the Cascadena have, have five First Nations, uh, three in BC, two in the Yukon. And we have a history that, that really connects us through our laws and our way of life that have tied us to this area. And it's really allowed us to have that mutual desire to, to care for our lands. So here's a bit more of um, a visual to, to show you where exactly we are in, 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 uh, in the scale of Turtle Island. So the the white is in BC, the gray is in Yukon and Northwest Territories. And as I mentioned, the land's vast. So actually, you know, in terms of, of the types of geography in, in, in our territory in the north, you know, we have areas that we refer to as the Chinla. So the areas above, above the sticks that take us above tree line and the beginnings of the tundra. And then out to the east, we have the, the incredible Liard, uh, Liard River Valley, which takes you down into the Mackenzie River Basin, which is one of the largest waterways in the world. And in the south, we have the, the Rocky Mountain Trench that, that connects many of the mountain people in our territory. And then to the west, we have important trade networks and relationships with our neighboring nations that connects us more or less all the way to the coast. So, when you look at this land, I, I look at it and I know that every square inch of it has been traveled or lived on by my people. And our elders have told us how our footprints are everywhere. And it's our ancient trails and the rivers within our traditional territory that, that connect us. And at the center of all those networks is the heart of our people. And like so many indigenous communities uh, in Canada, the Casca see ourselves as being part of the land, that we are kin to it, they, it's our relative. 
and it includes all the natural elements of our land and we are affected and in turn affected by the lands around us and it's really those interactions that have helped enhance and preserve the ecosystems we live in. And uh, I think one of the best ways to describe that connection that I often think about is what an, a well-known elder in, uh, in my family once said. So this picture here is a picture of George MacDonald, who's um, my great uncle, great, great uncle, but maybe, um, but he was part of my mom's family. And he grew up in the Northern Rocky Mountains. And uh, he talked a, a lot and passed on a lot of knowledge about Cascadena land ethics and our worldview. And I'm so glad someone recording him, recorded him saying this because it's such a wonderful way to visualize that deep connection to the land that the Casca have that's so spiritual in nature. He said that the people are like the trees. They're born and raised in this country. And when we are old, we go back to the ground like a seed. We are the seeds of our people. That's the way of this country. It is run by the seeds. Because when a people call themselves part of the place, it's because of our, our connections to our lands and our babies were born here and we grew up here and we live in this land and therefore we're laid to rest in this land and we're reborn in this land. So we have grown and lived here and died here like a tree. And it's really the land that's the center of our ethics of our entire world is, is Dena. In a lot of ways, it can be a reflection of our very souls, of who we are, of what we value, of how we relate to each other. And it's that deep sense of connection to a landscape that's really essential to our, to our identity. Because we believe as Dene that what is good for our land is good for our people. And we're constantly trying to develop a relationship to the land that supported us. And that's why the Cascadena have always had that very strong responsibility ethic and ethical duty to be good land stewards. And it goes beyond, way beyond really, um, Western concepts of environmental management and conservation because it's based on a sacred connect connection. And we're always trying to govern ourselves according to that deep spiritual attachment to the places we call home. But in the first part of this workshop, we're talking a little bit about history. And I know that this perspective here is, is very vulnerable to disruption and disjuncture. And the Casca, like many Northern uh, Indigenous communities have a uh, historical and current day social reality uh, that has dealt and continues to deal with colonial oppression. And it's really those forces of colonization that drew borders that fragmented our territory. They imposed new place names on our mountains. They allowed for resource extract, extraction and they really worked to undermine our knowledge systems through residential school and, and, and suppressed our language. And we know that to dismantle these systems, we need to start creating space to hold indigenous ways of understanding because it really is going to be for the survival of our communities and our nation to do that. And we've restored faith in knowing that the answer to that survival really lies in that land-based connection and the principles like what George MacDonald said about that deep seed-like connection to the earth. And our, our time in this land is significant. And even though we use photographs to show that history and that connection in our modern way, we know that our time here is not best understood through linear time because linear modeling doesn't really show us the cycles and the connections of our people in this land. So I wanted to bring forward a bit of a visual representation for you because I think it might be helpful. So hopefully you'll see this here. It's a bit blurry. Um, but as an archeologist, I, I've always been a bit uncomfortable with the concept of history and time. Um, because archeologists will say, oh, your ancestors have lived here for you know, 7,500 years or whatever, but really it's about time immemorial. It's about when time no longer has meaning because it isn't as important as looking at each person's life and their stories and their knowledge and how they pass that along through spoken word and memories for millennia. So I have this hoop here and I know it's a bit blurry, but it's a, it's this, it's a, a hoop kind of looks like a medicine wheel. And it, it, to me, it represents an Indigenous um, understanding of time. 
And you know what, maybe I'll change my video uh, feature here so that you can actually see it properly. There we go. You know what, Jillian, that would be great. And if you could yeah. leave it, the blur off, um, I yes. think it might be affecting your audio a little bit. Thank you. Oh, okay, good to know. Okay, so on this hoop, I have, uh, I have beaded um, lots of different beads. And this, there's a big bead at the top here that you can see. Let's say that that's us. And the bead next to it is our, is our mother, and then our grandmother, and our grandmother, and so on. So five of these beads, let's say that represents 100 years in linear time. And then 50 of these beads would be uh, 100 years. And then 500 beads would be you know 10,000 years, and so on. Well, I ran out of beads, but I think I have around 500 on here. But, but what's important here is that let's say this represents 500 generations of women who have lived their lives. They've taught their children how to become knowledge holders and the eventual storytellers that would pass on, on the worldview and land ethic that we're talking about today. And it's a very beautiful web of being that keeps going around and around in relation to each other. But that connection was disrupted in our country, you know, around 500 or sorry, 400 years ago on the eastern shores of our country. So that's roughly six, 16 generations. That's what this little, little thing, little beads in the middle here represents. So that represents when, when uh, Europeans came to Canada, you know, when the doctrine of discovery and the impacts it had on, on this concept of terra nullis, that the land was empty that impacted these women and their children but luckily they had the generations before them and those after them that kept them very strong and resilient and if we even take back a, a, a step further in terms of the colonial influence uh within my homeland in Denakaya, it's around 190 years when european explorers came up to northern bc and yukon so that's just eight generations eight beads and when you compare the two, you really see that deep unseated connection that the Dena have to their lands. And it is one that's hard to describe, but I think when you see it like this, when you look at it in, as a visual of these hundreds of women who are telling stories and living in this place and coming to know it and adapting to it and learning from it, that sacred connection is what you see in this hoop. And that's truly what we're trying to protect through our IPCA in a lot of ways. But before we can do that, there are, there are events in our past that we need to reconcile to help us move forward in a good way. And one of those is this significant contradiction that we have in the Northern Canadian landscape of this like simultaneous desire for exploitation and preservation and therefore the land you know that we know it and the environment that we know it is this master narrative in our societies and there's an ideological clash there and it's why our land has become so value laden and, and political and that disjuncture has really affected the fabric of, of Casca society uh, when we're looking at land rights and development strategies. But I know that it's because of that, it's so important for us to be able to share our stories and our ways of knowing to influence people's understanding of the world so that they know what did exist, but also what continues to exist. Because there's a lot of healing that is occurring right now for the Casca within our traditional territory uh, from past injustices. So for example, many, many of you might not know this, but our communities just went through a fairly major healing journey with the demolition of the Indian residential school that, that existed in Lower Post. And you see some of the photos of that here, but that building and the memories that remained in our community was just up to a few months ago. It just came down a few months ago. And uh, I think that in reflecting on that, You'll see the image there uh, that someone threw into the fire saying, we are still here. It really connects with what an important casket elder and residential school survivor, Dave Porter said. And I've been learning a lot for him, from him over the years, but he had this very important passage that I think best explains the, the reconciliation efforts of our people. He said, today, tomorrow, and all for all the days that follow, let us begin the work to end our suffering. Let us end the hurt. Let us stop hurting each other. Let us refuse to be victims any longer. Let us hate no more. Let us forgive. 
Let us love humanity once more. Let us reunite our families. Let's rebuild our communities and strengthen our nation. We are survivors. And it's really that that's the internal <clears throat> reconciliation efforts that the Casca have been doing because we know at the bottom of our hearts, our land is our future. And that physical space is where we can heal from these injustices of our past. And it can also help us come together once again as, as Canadians to gain that lost spiritual heritage that we all have and, and reconcile our relationship to the land and, and to each other. So in essence, what we're trying to do is, is restore Casca values to Casca lands. And it's really those relationships that have been guiding our nation's vision around land stewardship you know, how we want to protect and preserve and defend Danakaya. It's, it's an ethical responsibility and, and we know that it's in jeopardy. So we really hope that the future is one where we can have a strong language again, a strong land, and that our relationships with governments and the public is strong so that we can focus on what brings us together versus what divides us. And really, I think that's the mutual responsibility that we all have to ensure that our lands are healthy and sustainable. And our perceptions of the environment are really strongly connected to our own personal narratives, right? And each of you will have your own about how you choose to engage with the world. And it really reflects your own individual history and your own cultural path. But I think so many of us are on this time of reawakening uh, and reowning our life's experiences. And I know that's what the Casca are doing. We're seeking to reclaim that, that connection and, and restore it and recover it. So a lot of rewords, but basically it's the first step to, to cultivating action. And I think that's what is such an important part of two-eyed seeing is um, it's about storytelling and truth telling, right? And when we can embrace diverse understandings of, of reality and how we relate to our planet, it's gonna help us protect it as well. But in order to do that, we need to be more actively and sensitively involved in the different ways of protecting land that's informed by the land itself. So the Casca and our relationship to Denakaya, I think is a really good way to examine that human environment relationship and the, the spiritual connections within it because it'll help us understand that really at the end of the day, we need to start giving the rights and responsibilities back to the land. And, and that's really what we're trying to do with, with our proposal. So I think I'm gonna end it there for now. And I know after a bit of um, the breakout uh, time and the questions that we posed to the group, we'll dive in a little bit more to what we're doing um, with the IPC on the ground. So thanks. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, wonderful teachings there, so powerful. Um, we're gonna have a breakout uh, conversation. We're actually gonna save our report backs till the end or you know, kind of bring that into the Q&A. And we're gonna go back over to Jillian for the second half of her presentation. Great. So thanks very much everybody. And uh, sorry for the bumps in the road there. Back to you, Jillian. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing maybe even if people wanna put some thoughts in the chat. Um, for us to, to look at. But really the reason why I pose that question is I think um, we kind of forget that there's so much meaning, um, deep meaning behind uh, indigenous-led conservation proposals. And it, they don't come from nowhere, <laughs> you know, and they're not just about uh, protecting the environment, they're about protecting a way of life. And so that's what I, I wanna be able to show you and get into a little bit more in detail with this next part of the presentation about what it actually can look like establishing an IPCA and just taking a little bit more time, digging deeper into that Cascadena uh, vision for the land and how it can be visualized on the ground. And uh, many of you probably know the history of IPCAs or indigenous protected and conserved areas but if not, you'll get a bit of a taste of what it is through this example and, and the CASCA proposal that, uh, one of the CASCA proposals that our nation is putting forward, 
I think is a great, a great way to look at this because there are so many different innovative ways of, of mapping attachment back to certain landscapes. And because of the current uh, um, environmental and political atmosphere in Canada, it's really providing nations like the Casca with an opportunity to respond to that changing ecological climate that we're seeing, but also the role of our people in recovering aspects of our land. And it really sprouted up with Canada's pathway to target one as, as a way to a new approach to conservation, I guess you could say. So now I think we're at 30 by 30, right? So it's something that Indigenous communities have actively been in support of. And one of the major outcomes of that strategy has been the promotion of Indigenous-led conservation through Indigenous protected and conserved areas. But I believe that the Casca have been establishing protected areas for millennia. I know I'm not alone in thinking that many Indigenous nations feel that way about their lands. But now we have this federally recognized tool to help us achieve our ancestors' vision. So just a bit of context, uh, as I mentioned before, the Nakaya, the Casca traditional territory is quite large. And there's so many important sacred sites and cultural homelands and important areas within it for our people. But our elders and our community members and our leaders have come together over the past few years to really define an area that encapsulates the core cultural and spiritual areas of our people in British Columbia. And, and we call that area Deneke Kusan. So people see that name and they're like, what does it mean? There's got to be something to it. And and there's lots of meaning behind it, honestly, but to us, it represents it re represents a core area uh, within our territory in BC that really is the spiritual and cultural homeland of our people. And because the the Casca are extend beyond uh, the borders that divide us, it's a core area in in British Columbia. We have core areas in the Yukon as well. But Deneke Kusan is a phrase and a saying in the Casca that, that really translates to the people's way and how to honor the way of our people. So our ethics and our laws is to protect our culture and our land. So to us, it's a reminder that as Indigenous peoples to these lands, we will always be here. Deneke Kusan. So as long as our lands are here and if our language is here and our laws and our culture is here, then us as Dena are here. And that's really what's tied together through our IPCA. And it did come from that ancient vision of our people, but it was something that was recently sanctioned and mandated by the Denakai Institute who I work for um, at an elders gathering a few years ago. And that was a very catalyzing moment for us because we knew our communities were ready to fight. We are ready for to fight for that vision for our people and our, our lands in a, in a modern context and show people what land stewardship looks like from a Dena perspective. And then obviously another catalyzing moment was that recognition and acknowledgement from Canada on, on climate targets and knowing that Indigenous led conservation would help us, you know, achieve those collective biodiversity goals. So, you know, the overall motivation for us is, is based on that on our need to preserve our way of life. But at the same time, we know we're gonna be able to protect very unique and sensitive ecological, historical and cultural sites and really be able to reclaim our customary laws and roles of, as land stewards in the process. So when you pair that indigenous knowledge with the science-based conservation analysis that I believe um, was sent to you in uh, via email, that really provides the biological justification in addition to the cultural one for why we need to protect Deneke Kusan, because we're able to conserve ecosystems, but also cultural heritage. And that's why we drew very specific boundaries uh, to help us focus that proposed area on the exclusive use area of the Casca in our traditional territory and uh, you know, reduce any potential concerns from neighboring nations but also other development areas so that there wasn't, uh, wasn't issues with those, with those sectors. So just another map to provide more context on where Denek Ekuzan is within our traditional territory. So you'll see that it's on the BC side of, of, of our ancestral lands, as I mentioned, and there's a varying degree of um, 
different landscapes within this area. You know, we have barren mountain summits and glaciers and plateaus, thick boreal forests, wetlands, lakes, rivers, and it's all throughout the 100,000 square kilometers of, of land within our homeland in, in northern BC. But within that, there's that core heart area that I mentioned. And in that area, it's this, you could look at it as the size of Switzerland, and it's completely free of roads, power lines, development. So that area that you see in purple here, that's our proposed area. And it's it re measures roughly uh, 40,000 square kilometers, so around 4 million hectares. And it's situated wholly within uh, the Mackenzie River Basin and and includes five uh, different ecoregions, 10 major watersheds, four biogeoclimactic zones, and the list goes on. But more importantly, it provides uh, connectivity to existing protected areas as well. And you can see some of those in the green here. And we know that in order for us to protect that area in purple, that core cultural area, we know we need to start dismantling some of the boundaries that have forced us into the separate communities uh, that we are today. So we're now being kind of put in a position to discuss the lines that have been drawn and are continually being drawn within Denakaya that have in the past separated our traditional territory into development areas, land settlements, ecological reserves. And we want to we want to do away with that and start anew and looking at it in a different way. And, and in terms of scale and vitality, uh, this, as you can imagine, 40,000 square kilometers of, of, of pure um, a wilderness, as many would call it, it's a very significant contribution that Canada can make too, to be able to address the, the global crises that we're in today. But to me, it's my home, it's beautiful. And I just, I'm looking forward to sharing you with you some more pictures of, of this area, because maybe some of you haven't um, been able to visit it yourselves. But a lot of people are kind of asking us more recently, well, why now? We know why you want to do it and why it matters. Um, but, but why now? And I think the thing that comes to my mind a lot is that we need to be focusing on the reasons why still the vision here, then indigenous led conservation proposals like this one, there's important commonalities in all IPCAs across Canada. That's really based on that strategic shared vision of the nations that put them forward. And there's that sacred duty and responsibility that I talked about that needs to be recognized. It's not a new phenomenon. We truly do believe we have been protecting our ancestral lands for millennia, but now people are listening and now people see the work that we're doing. So we have more Indigenous communities having that support to be able to come to the table with these incredible proposals that are centered on their community's vision. And many communities are succeeding, but many of us are met with the very real political realities of our lands being very value laden. So that stewardship reverence, I think, is what's important to mention here. It's about maintaining and restoring conditions in our ancestral lands, because we know that we have to be resilient. Our, our lands need to be resilient. We have to be resilient. And it's about ensuring, yes, that ecological habitat is protected, but it's also about making sure that our post-pandemic path as Indigenous peoples in this country is rooted on healing and it's rooted on, on rooting our values back to the land. So it's about planting those seeds in a lot of ways um, for regrowth and recovery and reconnection. And IPCs are really making that possible and people are, are starting to see that. So I wanted to go through just a few of what those opportunities are, but and also what the barriers are, because that's one of the next questions we're posing to you. So because this, this DKK, Denik Ekusan, is based on our ancestors' vision, we really see it as a promise to our communities, but also to British Columbians and Canadians that this can be a place that can be yours too. That's why it's called the people's country. And, and it's a place that you can recreate, visit. It can be remain wild, but it can also be a cultured, bountiful place. And so we've designed it in such a way that everyone can enjoy it according to the values and understandings of the people who have called this home. And I think more and more Canadians are starting to see that as a good strategy 
because it's focused on partnership and, and, and recovery in a lot of ways. And it's about reconnecting our understandings to our, our collective lands. So we really do see it as a great way for us to build off of existing work in a lot of ways as well. Then Ake Kusan uh, overlaps a lot with the Muskoka Chica management area. And we believe that we, we strengthen the NK in a lot of ways. We're building off of it. We're not diminishing it. And we want to evolve how we can protect these places from an Indigenous perspective. And if we do that, we then can can protect a completely undeveloped part of the Rocky Mountain Trench, but while also managing it in such a way that our people will have a place for us to be able to move forward in solidarity and unity with others. So um, another obvious connection here too is in big opportunity is that we can be that missing piece in this wonderful puzzle um, within uh, the Yukon to Yellowstone Con uh, Conservation Initiative. And we really see us as being that missing piece between the anchors that exist, because we know that connectivity across landscapes, especially very large intact northern refugia like this one, provides that resiliency for ecosystems that we need. We need to protect large areas. We can't protect pockets of land. That just doesn't work. So DKK in itself, I think, pro provides connectivity to over 14 um, other protected areas. And that's a huge part of why our proposal is designed the way it is, because we want to ensure that expansive, continuous, remote wilderness can, that can be that benchmark. But another important opportunity that we see is that this, this IPCAs and Denike Kusan allow us to maintain and enhance uh, a conservation economy or an Indigenous economy, whatever you want to call it. But it's about supporting and growing those economies so that we can have, yes, resource development, but we can also have a balance of other economic opportunities as well. And the CASCA had made uh, various considerations to this around forestry, subsurface developments, you know, existing land uses like guide outfitting and other conservation economies when we were planning this to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to pursue that green economy and, and build the capacity we need and expand our knowledges of the environment and our heritage at the same time. And in doing that, it will also allow the CASCA to, to work with government, to work with Crown governments like BC, but also Canada to implement a co-management strategy around our ancestral lands, because we wanna co-manage this with the province. We want to come together to, to design this proposed area in a very collaborative way. And by being able to do that, we'll be able to steward our lands um, with the authority and jurisdiction to do so, so that our land guardian programs that we've had established for the past few years can continue to advance because they play a very central role in the management of Denike Kusan. And the facts and statistics are there to show that lands that are managed by Indigenous communities across the globe are healthier. And we know that to be true within our nation. We just want to make sure that that statistic remains true for future generations because a significant part of this protection comes from the Indigenous knowledge we have to these places, that heritage component. And we will therefore be able to help determine better management strategies because of that. It's all about bringing the Casca values to the forefront of what these lands and waters mean to us. And Indigenous Guardian Programs is, is, is a really important component of that ongoing management and stewardship. So the, the Casca in British Columbia have the Denananyada Land Guardian Network, and, and they are a guiding light in a lot of ways because we know that, that it's going to be them that is making sure that this landscape uh, remains safe. So some of the barriers um, that we've, we've encountered, if I think back to 2017, you know, when the federal environment minister acknowledged that IPCAs would be part of Canada's push to, to meet protected area targets, there was such incredible enthusiasm for indigenous led conservation. And it really sparked that wonderful outflow of proposals and support by so many of us. But there still are some big questions for, for us in the IPCA world. And a lot of those questions um, revolve around laws and authority or what areas will actually count as part of the pathway to target one 
or how will these areas be funded and monitored and enforced? You know, even things like long-term conservation financing is a really big one for us in that list. But we know to ensure that there's um, synchronicity, we've been focusing a lot of our energy on, on demonstrating to the public and to government how our vision is good for the land and how it's good for British Columbians and that there's mutual benefits for everyone based on the Casca land ethic and our different modes for protection. But we do find ourselves um, in a situation where the provincial government doesn't see it as an opportunity. And uh, it's why we feel there's an important need for redress uh, to help us understand what, how we're gonna actually address these current and future needs in our country. So it can be mystifying when we see that governments don't really see the value in IPCAs uh, especially since the CASC are bringing this forward. It's our gift that we're giving, giving to, to the country. Um, but instead of focusing on, on the negative, we've really been trying to show others what we are giving versus what we're preventing, right? And the challenge is that we often find ourselves trying to convince governments of why it's so important in Northern BC and why it's so important to our Indigenous nations, but truly, we have we see that IPCAs are that number one answer to reconciliation, and and we know that to demonstrate to the province to demonstrate to that them to that we need to come to the table with these wraparound supports from public and from local residents and public interest groups and neighboring nations and businesses and people like yourselves that can really provide that support to us that we can bring forward to the province. And that's what we've been working on these past few years through our statement of support, and which we've had many people sign, which is so, is so incredible because that's a, a big part of this is garnering that support. But there's also a big educational component to IPCAs. It's, it's about informing, informing people how to really understand IPCAs. You need to reframe the way we look at the land. You need to look at the land as if your children's material and spiritual lives depends on it. And I personally feel that important ethical duty to, to educate others in that way of thinking because I want to be a good land steward to Denakaya. I want to be a good mother to my children. And I want to be able to protect the lands and the way of life of my community because I know that without having that positive, loving relationship with the land, our people will continue their hurting and they're not gonna be able to grow into that strong uh, nation that I know them to be. And I want, I want to change the way we relate to and experience Denakaya because it's, it's part of the survival of my people. But the challenge we are facing is in showing the decision makers this about why and how we need to do it, this. And so the buy-in can be very difficult because we know we have a long ways to go in our society still to, to have others know the importance of indigenous value systems. And we're, we're still a value-laden and political uh, country. Um, we're constantly renegotiating what the land means to us. And, and the Casca have felt that the, our land and our, and our ways of knowing that land um, has been marginalized. And it still is almost perceived as being connected to a historical past. So we want to stop that. We want to ensure that that slow disassociation of our people from the land, it stops now. And us in the Casca world, you know, our nation's vision, it, it, it is part of that guiding light to be able to show the law and policymakers in our country that there's more opportunities than threats to be able to support IPCAs and land guardians. So where do we go from here? <laughs> um, you know, it's not always a clear path, but I, I think that's part of the journey as well. Um, we, we know that the partnerships are there. We know that people like yourselves understand the importance of this work about why IPCAs need to be the biggest focus of, of conservation in our country. And really what brings us together is that mutual responsibility uh, that we're one. All of us on this Zoom are part of that outcomes and we can, we can recreate this connection um, together. Because at the end of the day, we know as Casca, the Dene people, we're always gonna be here and we wanna protect that connection. And we know that others do as well. And it's about that harm, harmonious 
way of better understanding and appreciating these areas and their ecological integrity, but also honoring those sacred connections of our Indigenous communities and what they have to those places. So I, I know that where we go from here is really connected to how we work together because there's strong allies and in this work in the conservation world. And we know that we want to protect this connection. So a lot of the questions we've been asking others lately is, do you want to protect it? And I think I'll leave it there. Kola, looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jillian. And um, yeah, for our rest, the rest of our time together here, we have an opportunity to go into breakout rooms again, as well as a, a Q and A period. And you know, I think in here is is asking us very um, directly th this question, and, and it's the question we're going to um, have a little time together with in in small rooms again, and then come back together. Is what can you do to address the barriers and help realize? the opportunities for IPCAs here in British Columbia and Canada. I, indeed, this is a gift from the CASCA and how can we all be um, part of this? We now have time, uh, about uh, 10 minutes or so, for a sort of question and answer period for Jillian. And um, I'm actually going to start because there are already a couple questions in the chat and maybe we'll start with this and then otherwise, um, please, um, raise your hand or uh, you can put your questions in the chat. It is nice to hear hear from people verbally. Um, but let's start with a question from Francis. Does the Yahe decision signal any change from the provincial government towards uh, working towards the vision? Mm, yeah, no, it's a great question. I think a lot of people are looking at that decision and wondering how, how it impacts um, Indigenous communities. And even though that decision, from my understanding, is mostly around accumulative effects, um, it does impact consultation um, for Indigenous communities that we've already seen what that looks like on the ground. Um, the CASCA, because our rights and title are already recognized by the province, we do already have the jurisdiction and authority. We're trying to build on that with DRIPA and other uh, other tools that the province has put forward to help us make decisions on our lands. And because we're the ones bringing this forward, uh, they acknowledge that we have the right to do this, but whether or not they're going to come to the table to actually co-develop uh, this plan with us has yet to be determined. So yes and no, I guess you could say for the Yahi decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Uh, and someone, Rebecca Smith has offered, um, besides signing the statement of support, what can we offer to DKK? And I'll just put the link to that um, statement of support because that is one way that you can support. But Jillian, what else can, can people do to support yeah. you in, in this work? No, another great question. And I, um, I, for those who, who have yet to sign it, definitely do. You can go visit our website here. It's at www.denakaya.com. Learn more about our proposal, but I definitely encourage you to learn about all the other Indigenous-led stewardship initiatives that exist even within your own backyard, because it's going to be that educational awareness and advocacy that pushes uh, Indigenous-led conservation forward and bringing that awareness uh, and and if it if you feel so passionate to do so, start start mes messaging uh, your MLA and and your local politicians because every little bit of advocacy helps. We've noticed that already the huge difference that makes um, at at uh, turning heads um, with the higher ups in government. And there was another comment in the, the chat that I want to acknowledge because it's an important one. I've been using the word conservation a lot. And I think it is important to, to distinguish uh, stewardship versus conservation. Uh, stewardship is what the CASCA have always felt that they've had towards our, our lands. And it's a, it's a word that goes much farther than conservation as we know. And, and to us, it's about declaring those, those rights, those stewardship rights and responsibilities as well. And the CASCA are working towards developing their own declaration of land stewardship for Denakaya which will eventually lead into us developing our own laws and acts for that, that for our, our um, proposal as well. So I, I appreciate someone mentioning that because we should 
be using those uh, distinctive words more. And it's interesting to see that some of the ministries are now <laughs> using the word stewardship, which is kind of, a, yeah, very interesting to see how they're going to utilize that word, which to us means something pretty significant. So if they truly want to have ministries surrounding stewardship, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And Cheryl has, has a question. Um, could you elaborate on how DRIPA is being mobilized with this work? Mm, that's a really good, uh, really good question. Um, I would say that for all of us that are in this reconciliation work and conservation work, we, we know that there is that understanding that there's going to be an incremental time of us all adapting and adjusting to DRIPA and the policies and legislation informed by DRIPA. But UNDRIP is a huge part of IPCAs, and we have acknowledged that they are probably the most practical application of DRIPA in our mind because it is based on reconciliation. And um, we, we want to start acting now. And we know that BC needs to start fulfilling their own rhetoric for reconciliation if they really want to be that true leader. Um, and they need to start supporting these visionary plans. But we are faced with the real challenges that DRIPA isn't actually being utilized in the way that we would have hoped. We're not getting mandates. There's no discussion on uh, IPCA legislation. There's even no table to sit at a lot of the time to discuss these things. So um, we know we're not alone in feeling that way. Uh, we just need to start utilizing these tools and in the ways that we would have hoped. Um, and, and that's why you're seeing some nations making declarations on their own to protect their lands if, if BC isn't going to come to the table to do it with us. So, yeah, I would say that it needs to be uh, actualized a lot more than, than it is. And, and we're trying to help, help do that. But Indigenous nations can only carry it so far. We can only be the leaders for so long. People need to also take that action on and do it with us. Otherwise, it's not reconciliation. It's just Indigenous resurgence. We need we need all settlers, allies, everyone in government to move it along with us. And uh, I think a lot of people are tired. A lot of communities are tired because we, we've been doing it for so long and, and we know that we need others to be now taking on that baton and, and moving us forward. Yes. Yes, indeed. And, and Tracy says to also the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and you know, ultimately, this is this is why Wide is hosting these sessions is, is to be able to listen and learn and participate in this really important work. Uh, we have a question from Marcy, and Marcy um, read your conservation analysis and loved it. Um, she's wondering about your choice to use a conservancy designation. Is it because there just isn't the right conservation tool or legal mechanism um, mm -hmm. to cover what you really need and want to protect? Mm -hmm. uh, the bundle of values you want to sustain. So curious about sort of that, that choice of that design, designation. Um, you know, you're using the language IPCA, but I know in the conservation, in the analysis, it's, it's requesting a conservancy designation. So if you could speak a bit to that. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's a good question, because I think a lot of people see IPCAs and then they assume, oh, there's legislation or policy that it informs those or even an act or law around it in the province and there isn't. So we have to either decide if we're going to use the colonial tools that exist within existing crown legislation and laws and, and acts like the Parks Act um, to, to manage this land or do we go outside the box and develop something new. And there's so many different routes you can go. If you look at all the IPCA proposals across Canada, each of those communities are using different tools and understandings to help them achieve what they want to achieve. The CASCA, we've had a, a lot of success um, with the conservancy designation with the NIA, which is a, a con another conservancy within our traditional territory that's just coming into the final management planning phase. And uh, we see that that is an option, but it will only get us so far. We then need to start bringing in other understandings within DRIPA to help us make sure that this land is actually co-managed so that CASCA actually have authority and jurisdiction alongside the ministers to make decisions for our land. So there will need to be some adaptations to what we're doing. It's not just a conservancy and that's it. There's a lot more steps that we're gonna need to 
to take that it will advance conservancies to what we want it to be. Um, so it's just the first step, I guess you could say. <laughs> Great. Great, thank you. And thank you for those excellent questions. Was there anyone else who wanted to ask one, one final question verbally or in the chat? Hey, it's Fran here. Uh, thanks, great discussion. Uh, yeah, I am, I am sort of surprised, but not surprised uh, about trying to get provincial government to the, to the table and, and you, 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 in consideration of recognition of, of respective rights mm -hmm. and title. You no know, government's always about risk. So it would be, you know, if there's a plan in place on behalf of this conservancy as a decision maker, I think I'll be reluctant to uh, approve without consent or, or discussion um, land use activities that go against the grain, so to speak, and, and have that platform to, or to enable dialogue. So there is that joint decision-making ongoing. So yeah, I'm just a bit surprised. I, I hope moving forward in the vision um, from, from the signals that we're seeing, uh, that'll come to fruition. Um, I, I don't know if there's any other, um, on behalf of the government ministries uh, for engagement, like if there's the indigenous, uh, you know, mayor and, or, or et cetera, that where we can leverage or, or um, convey to, to government to, to come to the table, to create a board you know, where, where decisions are jointly made. I know the forest landscape level planning process is fairly novel and, and there's the intent there at that level to have indigenous communities involved, but et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm rambling, but <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get to a, a point where um, there's a platform to have dialogue and, and, and see this conservancy through on behalf of not just this generation, but generations to come. Thanks for the discussion today. Mm, no, thank you. No, I think you bring up a good point about just the direction we're going. And I think so many Indigenous communities are um, who even have government to government relationships and agreements like the CASCA do with the province, you know, moving away from treaty and moving towards reconciliation. What does that look like? How can IPCAs even be part of that approach? You know, and, and I think the biggest thing we've realized is that BC feels they're protecting enough land already, that they've come time and time again saying, oh, look at how much we are protecting. But really when you dig deeper at what they're actually protecting, um, is it actually indigenous, is it indigenous led conservation initiatives? Is it lands that have stewardship and cultural values? Um, and when you dig deeper, you realize that there's a big gap there and we're trying to address that because DKK in itself could bring the province truly to 19.5% protection. And it's big because it has to be, you know, we're trying to protect those caribou and make sure that they stay strong so that we don't see what's happening down in the southern part of our province. Um, yeah, just pockets of protection don't work and it's just getting, getting through to governments that yes, it may seem scary to protect this much land and, and make sure that it's there for future generations, but we have to do that um, for, yeah, for the future of our children. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so, so much, Jillian. <laughs> Thank you for your teachings, you know, for sharing your story and the history, the stories of your people. And I think really um, for challenging everybody here to be part of this change. You know, you have incredible amount of knowledge and and on the ground experience and it's it's such an opportunity for all of us to learn from you um, and and to see how we can put, be part of this so thank you so much for taking the time today and i really want to thank everyone for being here you know for for listening and for learning for going into breakout rooms for challenging yourselves to think about these questions um, to be in dialogue about this this hard history um, about what it means, you know, when we talk about conservation and stewardship and at what it means for all of us to support Indigenous people and communities and how we can play 
a very active role in reconciliation. It's, it's not optional. <laughs> it's a duty. And so, you know, it's important for us to take this time to learn. And I really appreciate you and Y2Y appreciates you coming to these sessions.